So switching focus from chanting to turning our attention to our body. And just taking a moment and making some adjustments in your posture if you find it helpful to have both your feet on the ground to sitting on the edge of the chair and allows the back to just come into uprightness with least effort. Just taking some time and just inviting relaxation. So we'll take a couple of breaths, allowing the out breath to elongate, getting a little bit longer with each breath. the door. So we connect with our breathing, allow our system to begin to settle with our breath. We use the elongated out-breath, extended out-breath to support a tension connecting and dropping in and nervous system regulating. And invite relaxation. The feet, the toes. Calf muscles. The knees. The outer thigh. An inner thigh. Hips. <coughs> I'm just noticing if it's possible to allow the <coughs> pelvic floor to soften. Inviting a softening and opening of the vertebrae in the lower back, middle back. Just allowing warmth <laughs> to move into the region of the kidneys. So that there's a, a nourishment flowing inwards. And that nourishment allows a relaxation. Relaxing the upper back.
shoulders, neck. <coughs> Moving up the neck to the base of the skull. Just allowing those points at the base of the skull to open and release, relax. Allowing the whole scalp to relax and soften and be more flexible. Forehead to relax. Softening the eyes and behind the eyes. Relaxing the smiling muscles. and the chewing muscles, the lips and the tongue and the base of the tongue. The throat, front of the chest, the middle of the chest. Coming back to the shoulders, softening the shoulders. Allowing the upper arms to relax. The lower arms and wrists to relax, the hands, back of the hands to relax. So with the tension settled, body relaxed. We can notice what is, what is present. Quality of ease or agitation. The quality of relaxed attention or contracted mind. A sense of comfort. Or the quality of vigilance. And just noticing what's present with a wide open, spacious awareness. If you are aware that there's still some tightness or tension or vigilance, then use this remaining time together to allow your system to relax, <coughs> to use the extended out breath to calm. And if you are aware of your comfort and ease, allow your attention to support that deepening.
it's helpful is to notice when the tension slips into a dull, slightly disconnected, pleasant, not, not clear state. And gently, when that is the case, allow attention to reconnect with something that's life-affirming, like the breath. and the out-breath. So it's natural when we're tired to just allow attention to settle into a, a low, an inactive, quiet, peaceful space where there's little awareness. With great kindness, we can invite energizing our body, heart, and mind. Air is enveloping and bringing kindness, embracing awareness. And discernment is checking and seeing what's happening, what's helpful, what's needed. And these two work in tandem together.
going to move into our somatic check in. Please join me standing or seated. It's your choice. <coughs> Back into the body. From the thinking space into the feeling space below the neck. First, coming into the dimension of length, allowing your vertebrae to stack one on top of the other down towards the earth. You can really draw the energy of the earth also up through the legs. Coming into the plane of dignity, into our center line, the dignity of this human experience, of walking on the earth, the dignity of what we care about. And centering in with, with is unfurling out along the shoulder blades, down through the hands. And I feel into the quality of belonging. I allow myself to take up space in this room, take up space in this body, coming to the edges of the body and just beyond. Can I feel for my presence? And the presence of others feeling for me. And when I feel into belonging, what comes online for me? The heart space, the throat. Is there a particular temperature, sensation in the body of feeling for collective, for belonging? Centering in depth, just opening up the back body to what's come before me, those who've got my back, who've supported me in my practice, and being here tonight, ancestors, known and unknown, those who've kept this lineage alive for thousands of years. And moving into the front body, really becoming three-dimensional, softening in the eyes and the jaw. It's the energy at the front of the body and how I'm meeting this current moment, how I'm moving towards what I care about. And then we're gonna center in our aliveness. So coming into center, which is a few inches below the belly button, and a few inches back, you can put a hand at the low back and a hand just below the belly button to really feel for the aliveness of this body. And is there an emotion or a mood that's present tonight? I feel for what's here, what's in my aliveness. <coughs> what's there? So we're going to start our mood check with Richard. Um, I'm feeling delight. So I'm moving to your left, Joe. Balanced. Calm. <coughs> Changes and adjustment. Nurtured. Gratitude. Quiet, strong spirit, and vulnerable body. Grounded uh, and welcoming action. Getting wiser, wisdom. Calmness. Sleepy, relief, cozy. Well, thanks everyone. That's our somatic check-in. <coughs> so, uh, on the 
October 16th class, I started the talk on hindrances and the injury. So we, we broached the subject, and I want to speak a little bit more about it tonight. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the specific hindrances, their antidotes, and what to, how to use them when they arise. And also explore how different remedies are needed when we are dealing with the injury what that looks like. But I want to also weave into this conversation the importance of our human connections and how that plays into our regulation, both with hindrances as we are experiencing them classically, as well as how to navigate when we're navigating with, uh, how they support us when we're dealing with limbic injury. So this sheet is the result of Bhikkhu Bodhi's genius, who went through the Satipatthana Sutta and compiled this and put the references of where things came from and the specific details of what the Sutta talks about. And what I want to mention is that uh, in that, so the first column of the specific hindrance and it has the English word and then the Pali word underneath it. And then the second column, the primary condition, or the first is the Sutta reference, the Samutta Nikaya. And then underneath that, it starts, each, each category starts with careless attention, and then in each category is different. So this wording, careless attention, is not haphazard. It's very deliberate. And it's deliberate because the problem isn't so much the arising of sensual desire or ill will or dullness or restlessness or doubt. It's not the presence of them. It's the careless attention with them when they arise. So it's helpful to remember that, that we don't make these things enemies, that we need to focus on the real problem is the way that we attend to them rather than their being there in the first place. So the primary antidote are the classic remedies that are described in the Satipatthana Sutta. And I just want to reiterate in the first one around sensual desire, the classic remedy is to bring attention to an unattractive object. And I want to reiterate that sensual desire arises differently for different people. It's often gender specific, though who knows how that plays out as gender is less and less binary. But when people are triggered from a visual attraction, it's going to have a different impact than when they are triggered by a feeling of emotional closeness. Okay, so when sexual desire arises in response to emotional <coughs> closeness, then how we need to practice with it is going to be different. So, Can for saying say how? Yeah, because you keep saying this, but. So, okay, so let's say that you're stimulated visually, and so part of the visual attraction or part of the sexual desire is rooted in the experience or the that body is attractive. And so the way of focusing so that we're looking at this in a different way is when we look at the different parts of the body, the hair, the head, the nails, teeth, the skin. You know, we can notice liver is not particularly sexy. You know, <coughs> spleen is not particularly sexy. There's nothing particularly <coughs> spectacular about spittle, <coughs> snot, and snowmobile fluid, you know? that when we have our lovely hair and it falls into our soup, it's actually not so lovely anymore. So when we look at our body from another perspective, or when we look at the physical attractiveness that we're experiencing by another body from these ways, then it puts perspective on it, okay? Now, if we're, our, our sexual desire is arising because of the uh, emotional closeness from the feeling tone, 
or from the desire to belong, to be merged with, to be close with. And then we contemplate the nature of feeling, that feeling changes, that we don't always feel the same way, that there isn't any feeling that is lasting, that we can't find a sense of lasting happiness by dissolving into a pleasant feeling. So I don't know about you, but I have this, I, I'm a feeling type. And so I have this sense that if I can, when I have a pleasant feeling, that if I can completely dissolve into that pleasant feeling, then that's actually where I'm going to be the happiest. And so it's like this sense of merging, that if I can release my sense of separation by dissolving into the pleasant feeling, then I become one with pleasure and pleasantness, and that's where I want to be. And so when I see that that's what's happening, and then I look at it from the perspective of, of re- bringing the discernment that there is no feeling that lasts, there is no me that I can find a permanent lasting experience of in a sense object, then it gives me um, a little bit more perspective on this sense that if I dissolve into the feeling that that's going to bring me some kind of ultimate joy. Um, and, and, and the way it works is not by denying the pleasantness of the feeling, it's just putting it in a bigger perspective. Exactly. And what I haven't spoken about yet in this course, and it's its own course, is the whole movement of attachment wounding and how these things are playing out. And so attachment wounding, really, it's, it's a big conversation. It's not something that I can do justice in a, in a minute or two or a few sentences. But it's this, it's when, when our basic needs were not met with uh, kindness, <coughs> attunement, when our adventures to explore were not encouraged with alacrity and support, then what happens in our nervous system is our primary experience around trust and around attachment becomes wounded. And that wounding then becomes a lens through which we experience ourselves, we experience others, and we experience the world. And so I gave a talk many years ago about the way sexual desire and all of this comes together. And I'd be happy to send out the link if, if you find it interesting to listen to. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is very disinterest, very interesting because I listen to it. Uh, just a little more about just how, um, just speaking to how this can sound like kind of a joy kill, and that you know I feel like I want to have the perspective that the world's a beautiful place, and there's things that are delightful to me, and people that are delightful to me, and things and people that I want to be close to, and. Um, Brilliant question. Absolutely brilliant question. So part of what's helpful to remember is that the Maha Satipatthana and the Satipatthana Sutta were given to monks. Okay? So as celibates, you know, life life or whatever, as a celibate, celibacy as a practice requires not engaging in sexual desire as activity. So as as people who are not monastics, that's not our precept requirement. We can make choices about whether we want to be sexually active or not. And from the perspective of watching the way suffering arises, when sexual desire is out of control, then we can notice whether we're celibate or we're not celibate, it's a source of a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. So what we have to see is that when we're not celibate, when it's, it's not a, like an off-limit topic, then it's really helpful and healthy to bring this into our practice where we're working with intimacy and looking at the spectrum of when it's in working with instinctual desire, when it's with emotional connection, when it's with a, a longing to be fully embodied and close with another, when it's an expression of joy and pleasure and creativity, or whether it's coming more from um, other motivations. So as lay people, we have a much wider spectrum of where we can choose our practice to be. As celibates committed to 
not engaging in sexual activity, the, I mean, certainly the, what we can do with our practice is rich, but the, the, the activities that we can engage in are much, much, much more defined. So part of what was interesting about that talk was I was speaking about this from the perspective of being celibate and how to practice with it from that container and how many things became clear to me as a result of working with this stuff in that way. Does that help? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Richard? Yeah, I was wondering, um, maybe this is too simple a question, but um, hindrance to what is my question? Because it's it seems to me that, um, I mean, there's, there's uh, the hindrance itself um, can be the object of my attention, and so, like, therefore, hindrance, it's not a hindrance to mindfulness, uh, necessarily. What is it a hindrance to, like, um, the path of stepping off the wheel of samsara and, like, not re- being reborn eventually is... I mean, that's the sort of context that this was given in, wasn't it? So, do you remember this that yeah. I passed out? Okay, so... You're really familiar with... <laughs> So in this, in this wheel, we have the red side, which is the flood, and we've got the green side, which is the path. And the hindrance is a hindrance when we actually don't have the capacity to just observe it. And this whole thing is cycling, and what we end up is contact, feeling, craving. And there isn't the observation of it, so we don't have much choice. It goes from craving right into becoming birth, and then from birth goes into aging, sorrow, pain, grief, and despair. So when there is the ability to observe genuinely and interrupt this cycle, it isn't a hindrance, it's an object of mindfulness. When it's a hindrance is when we don't have the power of attention to observe, and the whole thing is cycling without choice and volition, and we keep ending up into this birth, aging, sorrow, limitation, pain, grief, and despair. Now, where it's a valid question, okay, so let's look at sexual intimacy, for example. You know, from a monastic's perspective, being involved in sexual intimacy is a disaster. <laughs> it's a complete disaster. For ordinary people, that is actually not the case. So from an ordinary perspective, then it's much more refined, nuanced about whether sexual activity has heart, has trust, has closeness. Is it just animal pleasure? Is it instinctual? And as a lay person, we get to choose where we want to be on that. We're not under the external requirement that we limit our experience in any way. We get to choose. But what we can or are invited to notice is that when we... So part of the reason, like I remember going to a talk his, the Dalai Lama was giving it, it was on the Four Noble Truths, it was at the Barbican in, in England, and most of the monastery went to go listen to it. He's talking about dependent origination, Four Noble Truths, and sex. And he said, and he said, there isn't anything wrong about sex, but when you have a strong instinctual desire like that and you work with it in terms of practice, then it has the capacity of cooling out the nature of the way desire arises in your system. And because desire is one of those hubs around which this whole cycle keeps revolving, when desire is cooled out, then the whole way we relate to things changes. So because sexual activity is one way desire expresses itself, which is not required for our living, we don't have to have sex in order to survive, then when you deliberately take the choice to not engage in sexual activity, it gives a possibility for perspective on the way all of this cycles. 
It also gives possibility for a tremendous amount of repression and tremendous amount of transference because the sexual desire is not allowed. And what is allowed is anger. And so what happens sometimes for celibate people is they're frustrated and angry all the time because they're not dealing with their, mm. with their sexual frustration. And so it just gets channeled into another area that is less shameful. Okay. So it's not simple. It's not a simple practice. And yet the possibility of it, the possibility of liberation is great. But it's also amazing as lay people for us to welcome this into our practice, to allow this to be the full part of our body experience, our heart experience, our loving experience of getting to know what it's like to have a body, what it's like to be in relationship, what closeness feels like and how these things can be developed in a way that is supportive and nourishing, and when it's not. Particularly when we're interested in like, uh, repairing the primary sense of insufficiency, not enoughness, not trusting, not safe. Mm -hmm. And these areas of sexual intimacy and closeness and holding, being held and holding, can be deeply restorative. And they can also be injuring if they're not done with skill, kindness, or honesty, or integrity, or something. It's rich, 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 rich. You could spend a year <laughs> on this one. For the rest of our lives. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, okay, so when we come back to this map, and we're just looking at this first topic in terms of careful attention to an unattractive object, the Asuba, and the classical teachings refer to the 32 parts, then any of us for whom we are not visually stimulated need to use our discernment and translate this into the way that we are stimulated so that the unattractive object that we pick is one that is appropriate for the root of what is underneath our desire. You following? So if we just make this simple, which it never is, if visual stimulation is coming from cisgendered men, and there are people in this room that are not cisgendered men, then we need to find different ways of using this instruction that works for us. Okay? Now, um, ill will also. Classically, there is nothing useful about ill will. All right? It's not helpful, it's not good. And one of the things that can happen is we can develop a belief about this that ends up causing a suppression and a repression, which then means that our ability to access this energy is limited, and then it causes like other issues. That's on a psychological development. But I'm going to switch gears and talk about what happens from an Olympic perspective in a minute. But what I do want to notice um, is that in each of these in each of these, under the primary, uh, the other remedies, if you look at the fourth column and it says other remedies, in every single one, in every single hindrance, good friends and suitable conversation is listed. Okay? So this is the classic teaching in the Satipatthana Sutta and in the commentaries. And so I just yesterday watched a video of Thomas Hubble describing foundations that are needed for healing. And he speaks about developing precise attunement, expanding capacities, developing group coherence, and recognizing the trauma field that we are in, that we are part of, and moving past separation as, as learned skills that we bring to our relational field. The more attunement, the greater the coherence. This absolutely correlates to increased level of healing. 
And so we can learn how to do that for ourselves with ourselves, and we can learn how to develop that with each other so that we support each other in this work in a way that's different than just, mm, hi, how's it going? You know, by bringing the quality of presence and skilled and sensitive, appropriate attunement to what's happening as a way of witnessing and seeing each other. So this capacity of the relational field is both effective when we're dealing with the classical hindrances as they're arising, and it's also true when they're the result of limbic injury. Now let me speak about the fight, flight, freeze response and what starts happening when we start healing that, okay? So the limbic system is involved with the fight, flight, freeze responses, and its first response when there's threat is to fight, to battle, to negotiate, to leverage, to say no, get out of my space. When that's not available, the next response is to, to run away, okay? When running away is not available, then we go into freeze. When we have been frozen and we start to feel angry, this is actually a sign of health, we're thawing. When we have been frozen and we want to get the hell out of here, we want to run, we feel restless, this is a sign of health. We are thawing. It's a good thing. When we're frozen, we have little choice, we've got little capacity. Thawed, we have more. So, Let's transpose this onto a meditation retreat, all right? So if you've been in a freeze, you go on a meditation retreat, and all of a sudden you feel angry as hell, or you're restless as hell, and you want to get out of there. And the meditation teachers, or the meditation instruction says, stay still, don't move, you know? <laughs> Observe your anger. Observe it. It's like, no. You don't need to observe your anger. What you need to do is you need to mobilize and engage with the anger in a way that is safe and is not going to cause harm to you, to somebody else, or to the environment. So let me tell you two small stories, and then I'll move on. So I mentioned the fabric softener, that my system, I was activated because of mold. I had 50 food sensitivities, and I was chemically sensitive to household products. And I went to this house, and I, she did everything she could to clean the house and get everything out of the house that might possibly be activating. I got into bed, and the sheets had been washed with fabric softener. My system lit up, and everything that I knew to do was not working. But the next morning when I got up, and I got on the bike, and I rode my bike. So I engaged the muscles of my legs that ordinarily would be running away. When I physically engaged my muscles, it was only then that my system started to calm down, and that I could actually engage my frontal cortex in a way where it can communicate with my nervous system. Before that, I, it wasn't connected. They were disconnected, okay? This is another situation, and it's not quite the same as a limbic injury, but it's the case of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a systemic repression. So I come from a family where anger, for me as a child, was terrifying because it was never handled very skillfully. And so I learned from a very young age that anger is terrifying. It's not a good thing. It's scary. It's dangerous. And living through the monastery, there was many times when I got angry, and there were some times when I was absolutely furious, but I couldn't process my anger very well. So there was one time when something happened that made me really angry, and I couldn't deal with it. So I went on a three-month retreat, and I remember sitting on this retreat, and like, you know, the smoke is starting to curl out of my ears. You know, I'm just feeling so furious but I didn't know what to do with it. So I was in Switzerland, in the mountains. It was winter time. We were on the edge of this wilderness, and I was scared to death, okay? So I took, 
incense and candles. And I walked like half a mile away from the monastery and made this protective circle and did all these prayers, made this be for the benefit of all living beings and lit my candles and lit my incense and threw rocks and swear. <laughs> and I wasn't swallowed up by the earth, you know. Mm -hmm. But I needed to give myself permission to allow the energy and to express it because what was happening was my system had this basic Buddhist trip that anger is bad <clears throat> and that there was no way of engaging with it and expressing it on any level that was anything other than bad. So I took myself away from people and into a situation, it was middle of the night, it was 15 degrees below zero, you know, and threw rocks until I was beet red, you know, and sweating. And I felt much better afterwards, you know, because it had been like, like blocked up, cramped in, stuffed down, you know. So we need to be discerning about where we're at because the classic instructions are useful in the middle of the bell curve and there are times when that's not where we are at and so we need to feel into where we're at to know whether what we need are the classic instructions or what we need is something else So meditation classically teaches that anger, running away, and restlessness are all hindrances that require antidotes. Okay? But from the movement from freeze to thaw, they are signs of health, and they are supported by engaging with mentally, visually, and enacting. We need to understand the context when it is helpful to engage and the context when it is helpful to observe. So one of the things that we need to understand, particularly around limbic injuries, it has signs of hypervigilance. It often is associated with a constant state of fear, anxiety, numbness, or depression. The sense of depersonalization where you you don't feel yourself. You feel like this empty, amorphous blob. You don't have a sense of definition. And when these, when there's things are flat, there's no emotional response to ordinary things that bring joy. When these are present, not just as a momentary blip, but as a kind of like a state experience, then this is an indication that what we need is different than the middle of the bell curve instruction. Yeah. <laughs> Same is true when, like for example, for myself, when anger was repressed. At that point, I don't think it was limbic injury, but I had internalized such a deep sense of fear that it absolutely was not at all in any level safe to experience this energy in its raw form, engage with it and express it, that I had to create a creative way that I could feel safe to do that. And so that's why I did this whole thing with this ceremony in the middle of this wilderness area, in the middle of the night, so nobody could see me, you know? And I, I was so terrified. I was so terrified doing it, you know? I mean, it seems absurd, but it's not absurd when you are up against these internalized beliefs that something you are doing is either very scary or bad. So we can also punch water, we can scream in the car, we can scream into a pillow, we can write, we can paint, we can dance in a way that allows energizes, expresses this energy in a way where we're not getting hurt and no one else is either. So part of the discernment that's needed 
is to know that we are not engaging this energy in a way to cause harm. So anger often, as its root, wants to hurt or shame or humiliate. And that's part of the discernment that's needed, is that we can engage with that energy and not hurt, shame, or humiliate ourself or anyone else. So when we want to run or need to run, again, sometimes what's helpful, rather than sitting still, is to give ourselves the permission to just run. So when we're moving from a freeze into a thaw and we have tremendous restlessness or we want to run, sometimes just run. And it might be that it doesn't take forever to get that energy moving and releasing out of your system. But when the muscles discharge, when the nervous system is discharged, then there's going to be a state change, and with that state change, it might be possible to re-engage the classical middle part of the bell curve instructions, and then just observe what's happening. So when we are doing this in a way which is regulating, the result is both an experience of being energized, relaxed, and present. When attention is relaxed, that's the indication that we are moving in the direction of being able to return to the classical instructions and just observe what is arising. When we feel fully present and aware, that's a completely different experience than we're feeling numb or disembodied or in a haze or completely emotionally flat and disconnected. <laughs> which some of us spend years in those states thinking that somehow that is what the practice is about. It's not what the practice is about. We've gotten in somehow in an eddy and we haven't been able to come back into the stream. So, I told the story about the Swiss monastery, but more recently, I took a self-defense class. And I love the self-defense class because we're punching and shopping and telling them, back off, get out of my space, you know, leave me alone. And with really loud voices, you know, with all these punching, chopping, and they're designed to hurt people. So I have been walking through the forests, like up at Redwood Regional Park, where nobody is going to lock me up. Back off! Get out of my space! Leave me alone! <laughs> and I come out of there feeling fabulous! <laughs> so I've got some of this energy that's still compressed in my system, and when I give it permission and I give it a form for it to express itself, it has a beneficial effect. And with me, it's complex because it's all tangled up with my body and my health. So I have, like, frail health, and it's connected. So when I give permission to let this stuff release, it gives me access to energy that's always there, but I don't always have available to me. You know, I can't find it. So now let's loop this around to the friendship and see how this ties in. We can see from Bhikkhu Bodhi's chart the one single unifying ingredient as a remedy for all of the hindrances is good friends and suitable conversation. <laughs> the one only thing that is consistent across the table is good friends. So we have to understand that for limbic repair, the way we learned to regulate ourselves as children was to get close to an adult who was regulated. You know, somebody who was calm enough, grounded enough, present enough. And they didn't have to be psychotherapeutically trained. They just needed to be there with us and breathe. Look at us, notice what was going on. And just that was enough for us to regulate ourselves. So, st 
standing near somebody who's regulated is grounding and regulating for us. In situations when our own family wasn't very attuned, when they were not good at seeing us or meeting our needs, when they were more dysregulated or more chaotic, then there's a learning that we need to go through to trust that that's actually available, that there are people who want to support us to do that. Yet, this capacity to engage with another person is the one thing that keeps showing up as something that is available or reliable or can be supportive. So we are wise to, to work it, to learn how to develop trust, to sustain trust, to bring more skill and attunement to each other so that we get better at seeing and witnessing ourselves and each other and bringing our loving presence with each other. Our loving witness, our increasing skill in attunement are the keys to developing more relational coherence and responding with increasing wisdom and compassion. It's fundamental, both in our own practice and with each other. It's written in the Satipatthana Sutta, and it's exactly what Thomas Hubble was talking about. And his, his whole passion is, is systemic trauma and how to heal from that. And so this relational attunement and coherence are the main things that are needed to come into the optimal level of recognizing our fundamental nature is not separate from the radiant, luminous nature of the mind. So, my little talk for this evening. I open up for questions, comments, feedback. Where does this land? What questions do you have? <coughs> Could you just repeat everything that you just said? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully the recording works. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I think it's interesting that Good Friends and Suitable Conversation was 2,600 years ago, the recommendation, because we've talked a lot in this class about how people's relational field was more intact at the time of the Buddha, but yet... You know, you couldn't choose your family. You probably couldn't choose very many of the people in your life 2,600 years ago. Maybe you could choose how you related to them. But this feels like a very modern, and maybe it's something in the translation, it feels like a very modern uh, kind of antidote uh, and certainly, you know, pressures on, right, to make those kinds of choices. So I was wondering the choice of good friends and suitable conversation. So I was wondering if you can contextualize this antidote a bit more in what you know about what the Buddha taught about it, and in um, I've been I've had this question for a long time, like that spiritual friendship is the whole of the path, based in uh, how to make it more of a of a practice that my Dharma practice is connected to. And so I think in that context, you know, the spiritual friends were people who practiced, who kept the precepts, who were interested in supporting you in your own aspiration to awaken rather than in um, just following whatever desire was arising in your mind. So in our contemporary world, there's all kinds of people with all kinds of levels of understanding, and some of the things that people recommend may be not be in your best interest. But it is popular to do things like that. You know, so this, so I think the spiritual friendship that the Buddha was speaking about is the spiritual friendship of people who have some level of wisdom and discernment and have your spiritual development as their highest aspiration to protect with you. Okay, and so in our world, you know, there's different people who've got different skills, different levels of maturity, different levels of 
attunement, different belief systems, different practices, and some of them are aligned. I mean, there's a spectrum of how helpful people can be, you know. So I think part of the reason why, like, the Buddha did a lot on emphasizing the value of monastic community was just that he set the monastic community up as the pinnacle of the wise spiritual friends whose most whose interest was in your spiritual development. But the shadow living in the modern world is just that it's not actually exactly like that. And that there's all kinds of things that go unacknowledged in the monastic community that there's very little ways of dealing with. So even as a monastic, it wasn't at all straightforward that just because people were living in the monastery, that by definition I could trust them. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to learn discernment about who was trustworthy and who was not, because there are plenty of people who are not trustworthy living in the monastery. So in our own practice, I think it's about developing suitable friends that actually are supportive of aims and values that, that are congruent with you and hanging out with them. And so how to do that, how to do that, how to develop French friends that are actually supportive and how to be discerning around people who have different values. It seems like the part of how we make friends, right? We do that kind of discernment, you know. You know, we might develop a friendship with somebody, and then you go along and go along and realize, well, this isn't really working out that well. I don't feel so good about this person. And so then, then discernment comes in and says, well, okay, so you kind of let it, let it go, let the relationship go. But doesn't this all feed back to this overriding? sense of how important uh, connection is? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this, this is, I mean, the Buddha spoke about the, the, the whole of the holy life was our spiritual friends. You know, not the half of it. And so the people that we hang out with have a huge impact on us. And, and so when you have like, so in an enlightened world, or when you have an enlightened master, the premise is, is that they have no ignorance and all that they are interested in is in your spiritual well-being. So spending time with a person like that is going to have a big impact. But in our complicated world that we're living in, there isn't an enlightened being around who has all of everything figured out, where they've got the, the transcendent layers realized as well as the personal and developmental levels realized. Yeah. So I cannot, t I mean, I could go on for hours about these wise, enlightened beings who were emotionally retarded, you know, or developmentally delayed, or had, like, <laughs> blind spots the size of Mount Meru that they absolutely couldn't see, but everybody else around them could. You know, so on one hand, they were incredibly wise, and on another hand, you know, a few quarts low. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I get uh, experience with, I mean, I go to 12-step meetings like a lot um, because I'm a recovering alcoholic and, and it's been my experience that um, I can take myself out of a trauma state most easily by just connecting with the person sitting next to me and they can be like a fundamentalist Christian, they can be just like nuts about money or sex or something like that. It, they actually don't need to have any level of enlightenment for me to actually benefit from the connection. So I think this is the difference between um, moving from a place of dysregulation to regulation and when we need wisdom input as a way of helping us find our own next best step. So from the place of regulation, if they are calm enough, breathing, grounded enough, then absolutely it doesn't matter their view, their politics, or anything about them. They will help move us from a state of dysregulation, which is otherwise hell, 
into just ordinary suffering. But from the place of ordinary suffering, sometimes the discernment and the input that we needed is more uh, subtle, more sophisticated. And then the values of the person can have a big impact. So again, what we're looking at is that our needs are different depending on where we're at. I can, I can also get, it from their lack of wisdom, an adequate mirroring that I can be imparted with the wisdom that's necessary in my whatever suffering of the moment there is. But that is because you have been practicing for decades. And when people are newer on the path or don't have that ability to use somebody's lack of wisdom as a way of getting to wisdom, then it can be confusing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, ideally, you know, we don't walk around in a bubble. We walk around as a fully feeling, present, alive, engaged person, m- making sense out of whatever is happening in front of us with the greatest amount of, of ease and with compassion and with wisdom. We're not asking the world to be different. We're just responding, needing, and supporting in this flow. Good. Good. Uh, let's see. I think I, I wanted to say that I, fa- I value the Sangha in the sense of what we have here, like in, in terms of friendships. I have many, I have a number of friends, and I love them all differently and dearly, and I get different amounts of wisdom from them and different levels of insight and political understanding or um, romantic understanding or whatever. But I think it's, this is like, maybe this is why I think of of the the Sangha as important. Because it's one of the places, no matter how much we're alike or different as individuals here, we have a common language and Mm -hmm. an attempt to understand the language of the Buddha. And I find that really useful and really helpful. That I can't find in any other collection of friends, even even the fabulous women I was in the convent with, we're still in touch with each other. We're all in our seventies and eighties now, and they're wonderful. They'll do anything for anybody, in their families or each other, and they are all talking about Jesus and going to heaven, and they have a whole different belief system than I have. You know, I totally respect theirs, and they as much as they'd like to. And I think they respect mine, they just don't know how, how different I am. <laughs> I just don't talk about it that much. Um, so I wanted to just say that, that I see value in itself of being with a group of like-minded people. And it's not the same kind of thing I can find in, in any other group. So and, and just one second, yeah. one other thing that I, I found very important in the beginning of our discussion, and it was about connection, um, connectivity, or rapport. I mean, one of the most recent research articles I found about what makes psychotherapy work or possible or helpful is literally the level of the connection with the therapist, the rapprochement, the rapport, the understanding. Not your technical skills or your whatever ideas about what they should do. And, and that's so interesting to watch because it's what you just said. They, they don't all share maybe my interest in Buddhism. Some of them do and, and are actually looking into it, which is interesting. But I can also see where their suffering lies in a way that I couldn't have seen before and that I don't analyze psychologically, which is a nice shift from how I was trained, if you follow what I mean. And you're witnessing rather than, than analyzing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are psychological reasons for some of their behaviors. But I can understand it from another perspective, which adds uh, layers, I think, of compassion and uh, ability to talk about what they're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. You know, which I I can't do in psychological language. So part of the reason why I was really happy about being part of this cohort is that, you know, over a four-month period of time, it's not the same as a drop-in group where people are coming from any old place and they just come and we're starting all over again every time to check in and to need and you know a tiny little little bit of introductions. Is that we are developing a relational field 
and getting to know each other. And that actually has some strength in it that supports us to do this work. And so for myself, what interests me is finding ways to have ongoing groups deepen their connection with each other. Because this work that we're talking about is not easy or simple or fast. And, it, and, the, and the relational field when there's intimacy and knowing of each other and witnessing and the feeling of safety and belonging and being seen and welcome is a phenomenal support to feeling like we have, we, we know we, somebody's got our back. We don't have to just always be pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. There's something to relax into that we can trust. And so it's been my, my passion to try and figure out a way of like having a cohort of people for like a couple of years to just deepen these themes and develop stronger connections that, that people start feeling that sense of being held in a process that supports this kind of work. Yeah, boy. <laughs> but don't, don't you also feel it's... Um, there's some value to that, even though we might have a common language, that we're, we're, we're different kinds of people, and there's like some diversity in the response you get to what you say. I'm thinking like, like when I say things to certain groups of friends I have like on Facebook, I already know what they're going to say. And it's like, we're just kind of like egging each other on, you know. There's not, there's not much. It's not any learning or kind of. I don't know. It's just a different type of. Not only is it purely red or purely kind of digital, it's nothing. There's not enough diversity in it to, to be very enriching. I don't know how to articulate the fact that. Each of you gives me a different response when I speak to you, and that's that's also valuable, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't, like in, a, in your family, you know, you have this whole spectrum of people that you were related to by blood, so you may not even like each other, but it's, it's useful that that group is a little bit different and inhomogeneous just so that you can get a range of things you can kind of get connected to, or I, I don't know how to Yeah, how to well, I, th I think rich, rich conversations. I'm wondering if it's time to pause and switch gears now. Are we, are we at a time? Shifting this discussion into an inquiry topic? Yes, it is 8.38. Yeah. Um, okay. Could I ask one more question? Please, yeah. I, I thought it was uh, really interesting hearing what we had to say about um, hindrances and sort of expression versus maybe stop and watch or, or even repression. And you talked about that in the context of shifting from limbic injury and also in the context of. Uh, I wonder, in, in your anger example, where it wasn't just about the injury, and I wonder if you could speak more to um, kind of how you think about where expression fits in. Something you said already, the principle was, okay, if, you're, if, if, if the hindrance is a state that is persistent, then maybe try expression instead of... I wonder if there's other principles like that, or if that's the one. So let me just say a little bit about the, my monastic experience, and then I want to switch gears, because this is a rich conversation that you're bringing up, and I don't think we're going to be able to do it justice, but I just want to touch it. So the monastic culture when I went to the monastery was is that everything could be resolved in silence on our cushion. That was the M.O., all right? Hmm. People living, you're laughing because it's obvious for anybody who's in a relationship living with each other that you can't resolve every relational issue in silence <laughs> on the cushion by yourself. Okay? <laughs> so as nuns, we were in this incredibly complicated situation for all kinds of reasons. And the nuns, when I first arrived in the monastery, were in not a very good space. And there was all kinds of things that we were upset about. And the upset was often with each other rather than with the monks. And so when the MO was to shut up and sit quietly and resolve it, it didn't help. So it took us years of patient, careful, 
making mistakes trying to understand that there's this whole component of relationship that requires relating. We can't get to relationship by being silent and not relating. And so we thought, I mean, the MO of the monastery was to shut up, watch your mind, and that's how everything was going to resolve. And we needed to learn how to disagree and to express our disappointment and how to deal with anger. And when it was skillful to to name our anger and when it was damaging to explode with our anger and to, to know the nuances of when our safety was dismantled to the point where it wasn't productive to stay in communication with somebody when there hadn't been enough repair. And none of that, none of that we learn from being silent on our cushion by ourselves. We learned in relationship and oftentimes with the support of somebody we brought in to like help us because it was such a tangle. We couldn't see it or figure it out. So there's a whole relational field which is important and that does not become illuminated in silence necessarily. And the skills of communication, of disagreement, of disapproving, of, of getting upset, of feeling hurt or dis you know, requires skill. It's not at all automatic that the more we understand how to meditate, then the more we're going to know how to communicate. In fact, it can be the opposite. So it's a brilliant question, but it actually requires its own separate developmental tools. I wonder, I, you know, I keep wondering why the Buddha didn't know this. <laughs> I mean, he probably did, and then it comes out in different ways, I guess, you know, that that's the, the relative and the absolute, right? I mean, that's where you do a lot of relationship is in the, in the relative world, and you're sitting on your cushion to go to transcendence. Well, I mean, the Buddha spoke about the, the qualities or the characteristics that help have community harmony, and... Um, and so there's the whole vinya, which was the community harmony and the codes and the conducts that, that helped support that. And there's a lot of wisdom in all of that. Mm. But again, it was skewed to what works for cisgendered men in a community who are celibate, rather than how it needs to work for women in a celibate situation. So we had to find our own way, because some of the monastic encouragement was to deal with the, the, tr the conditioning that's common for men, but it wasn't common for women. So, anyway, let's switch gears, shall we? So, brilliant. Tag it. Don't give up on it, because it's really important. Great. Yeah, that's something I would just like to continue hearing about. Yeah. So, maybe we can do an intensive on the relational field. Mm -hmm. Developing the relational field as a source of joy. Sounds great. Well, now we're going to move into a period of inquiry. And um, I don't believe have we done this style of inquiry before in this group? We have. Okay. So this is the spiral where we're going to turn to uh, groups of three and we're going to have the repeating question. No, it's not the repeating question. We're going to ask the question once, but we're going to keep answering it in a circle. Does that sound right? Yeah. Okay. So let's turn to a group of three, 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 three. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We're a little limited on time, so we're going to move quickly. Just taking a moment to settle in with this group. Taking a breath together. And the question is going to be, tell me when you feel safe seen and trust that others get you. See that again. Tell me when you feel safe, mm -hmm. seen, and trust that others get you. Mm -hmm. You know, you can really let that answer emerge from your body. Um, and are we going to repeat the question or no? Just that's it. Tell me when you feel safe, seen, and trust that others get you. And are we
we going to ring a bell? Mm -hmm. How many times? Just ring it when it's finished. Okay, here we go. We're going to do for 10 minutes. So the person with the shortest hair is going to begin. And then we're going to move to your left. <laughs> and, you know, there's an opportunity to take a breath in between each person speaking. But we're just going to keep going around and around until the period is done of practice. So, so when you're ready, you can begin. Is, is this like, sorry, just a question? Coming back to the larger group, we're going to move And our dedication of merit. Mm -hmm. All right. Would you like to join me standing? This is a practice of belonging. So you're simply going to join your arms with the people around you, and it's really about making contact. Huh? Yeah, we're gonna get a little closer. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so we're not like locking arms like we're about to protest. <laughs> you know I'm ready for that. So actually you can like loosen a little bit here. You're really just noticing that point of contact of the inner arm okay. where your inner elbow is meeting the inner elbow of the person next to you. Can you get a little closer over there, Marcy? <laughs> <laughs> to who? Because actually it's about, fun. we're like regulating with each other, right, around our nervous system. So I want to make sure mm -hmm. that you can actually feel that point of contact. Mm -hmm. So just taking a minute to right, feel for your edges of your body. And then can you feel for the person next to you feeling for you? This felt sense of belonging along the line of width. And what are the hallmarks of this feeling of belonging? I always ask, is there pressure, or temperature, or sensation? How does this felt sense of belonging work with the rest of your nervous system? Can you feel your heartbeat, your pulse? And where's your back body? your front body, noticing your ground. In what ways do you lengthen? Or in what ways do you contract in relationship to belonging? I'm just letting the answer emerge from the body. What's a wish that you have for this community of practitioners, fellow travelers on the path of liberation? And sharing that wish with each other, we'll start with Marcy. Steadfastness. And moving to left, trust and safety. Connection. A sense of worthiness. Uh, ease in the body. Warmth. Being seen. Meeting life with ease. Warmth. Warmth. Fluidity. Allowing. Thank you. And let's come into our shared dedication of merit practice, putting your hands to your heart, maybe even taking a minute to look around, see who's here with us tonight. Mm -hmm. This group of people will never be the same again. Mm -hmm. All that has arisen tonight mm -hmm. is shared. May the benefits of our practice be with us tonight and into the future. May we know the benefits of our practice, the possibility of transformation for ourselves and for all beings. May we share this out with all the people of Berkeley and Oakland and East Bay, with people who are facing difficult conditions around the world. May the safety and belonging that we've generated tonight be shared with all beings all creatures in all directions. 
And may we also know that we are worthy, that we are loved, that we have this connection of spiritual friendship with us as we walk this path of practice together. Thank you so much for everything today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, what was my one more thing?